Hell yeah, drinking at church, this is the best. It was like the first weekend, this guy goes up, he was like one of our first customers, he's like, I couldn't wait till you opened up in here, I got baptized in here, now I'm drinking a beer, this is awesome. And I was that like, awesome. that's pretty badass. That's a good one. Bobby says what he wants, how he wants, when he wants, and how much he wants, resulting in a special two-part episode of Back Pew Brewing. Part one, Saints and Sinners. Baby, yes, ma'am. Huh? what time is it? It's beer time. Where? Back Pew Brewing. Welcome to Stout Conversations, where every week we sit down with creative thinkers in the craft beer industry and beyond. Your hosts, Ken and April, live and work in a 24-foot RV, traveling the country in search of great stories around a great beer. Creating a community in a church is easy, and is definitely one for the saints. Creating a brewery in a church would be considered one for the sinners. Bringing the saints and sinners together in one building over great beer? Now that's what Back Pew Brewing outside of Houston, Texas is all about. Whether you like the front pew or the back pew, whether you are a sinner or a saint, Bobby has created a unique space to build a community around really good beer and jam and music. Come one, come all. Just leave the assholes at home. Welcome to church. What are you talking about, but your brewery is in it. Old church. Yeah, yeah. We have how did that. how did we end up in an old church? Uh, um, so what we did was we were looking down, kind of toward East Downtown, and we were thinking for like an Art Deco kind of old manufacturing facility. It had some cool and you facade. Mean East Downtown Houston. Yes, East Downtown Houston. And um, and so when we started looking, they were both very expensive. We outside the budget that I ever asked for my investors, as well as they were full of asbestos, which would increase that budget. <laughs> and I said, okay, we need to rethink massively. This. <laughs> and so we started looking around. We kind of thought, where's you know, looking at where the breweries are in Houston, just kind of put them on a map. There was nothing up 59. I uh, thought the area was cool. Kingwood, large community, 63,000 people, roughly. I'm sure it's grown since when we were doing that analysis. Um, and then we came upon this place, which, you know, 14 acres, metal building, little old church place. Awesome. Very cool. And that's kind of, that's where it came from. Um, at the time, I can tell you the name is a, is a fun story with the church thing. Because originally, so... Being an engineer and somebody who's passionate about beer, most of that's what I think of. So you have to have a hook, right? Some kind of hook. And I only had one ha-ha moment for marketing. <laughs> but I was thinking, like, so I, I did market research when I was in Nashville writing my business plan, which is creepy because it's basically staying around grocery stores, liquor stores, and watching people buy beer and then try to get them to talk to you about why they did it. Works sometimes, doesn't work other times, but you got to do it. And the ones that I found most interesting were the guys who had spent a lot of time looking at craft beer, and then they'd end up getting, like, a 12-pack of Coors or Miller or something like that. And the guy, what I found by and large was they're like, look, I, I've been told this crap beer thing is supposed to be better beer, um, supposed to be, you know, supposed to be made better, this, that, the other. I said, but I, I don't know what this label means. I don't know what the style is. I don't know if I'd like it. It's more expensive. And so it became very apparent to me that basically the way I described it, you can tell I'm a nerd when I say this, but the decision matrix is too big. So you have a lot of styles, a lot of brands. Artwork is getting crazy. So a lot of times you don't even know what style's in it. You have to like look it up. Really it, and so it's, it's getting really serious. The average beer consumer is not going to go through that much trouble. They might see something and think it looks cool and pick it up, but if they got to spend too much time thinking about it, especially at a higher price point, that's not why they're there. They're just getting what they always know. So I thought, how do you shrink that decision matrix down is the idea. And that's when I came up with the idea of having a saint line and a center line. Saint line, same white can, but just changed slightly, so that way you know there are different styles. Center line, black can, same thing, uh, you know, just different styles. And that way, you give your, like, any beer and wine steward who's trying to sell that person is like, what should I have? Well, anything from these guys in that can is really light and sessionable. Anything in the black can is going to be bigger, more robust, higher ABV. And then they don't have to think about it. They can try new things without really worrying about what those new things are, and they either find out, I don't like that, or I do like that. I didn't know that. What is this? So it's a Hefeweizen. Apparently I like Hefeweizen. I didn't know that before. I thought I only like light beer. Well, what the fuck are other Hefeweizens? And then they go and they maybe figure out what other Hefeweizens they like. Unoriginally, my idea for the name for the brewery was St. Sinners Brewing Company. That was not only is it a mouthful, the yeah, not only is it a mouthful and hard to put in shit, but it, you know, it becomes cantankerous. Um, so we, then we found the place and I was like, well, that's just awesome because we're St. Sinners <laughs> Brewing Company, old church, yeah, it works well. Then, and so we took over the space March 8th of that year, and we applied for trademarking. At the end of March, beginning of April, we got hit back from the trademark 
people saying like, hey, this is already in use. There's a Saints in, or turning sinners into saints or something like that. It's owned by Port Brewing Company, which is actually Lost Abbey. Gotcha. And so I said, okay, let's back to the drawing board. The bummer was I was out of ideas. And that's when I met the guys who really helped me start to develop the brand and kind of pitched them the idea. And I just couldn't get away from Saints and Sinners being so duality. Plus now we had an old church. I was like, hey, you can't give that up. Um, and so that's where the back key came from. They, sh- they sent me a lot of names, some heavily more one way, some heavily less one way. This wasn't necessarily in the middle, but it worked. Because in the, in the Baptist religion, the back pews were the saints and the sinners sat. The saints were the people who came, they sang the loudest and all that, and they showed up to the back so everybody else could hear the preacher. And the sinners <laughs> were the guys who were out drinking the night before, shouldn't have been, come in late, and then they leave early to, to throw up because they're hungover. And so I tied in that system to do that. Now, the only bummer is we haven't had a lot of luck getting that system out there, telling people about the system, because in my mind, I'd have like a black and a white tap handle next to each other, stuff mm-hmm. like that. Well, it doesn't so, work as well as I had intended. Let's just say it'll, so for, it's yeah, cool, yeah. but they just don't. No, it'll get for there. people who haven't been here, the idea is you still have Saints and Sinners. We still do, yes. So it's not just you changed the name to Back Pew and kind of gave up on Saints and Sinners. Yeah, Jesus. the duality is still it's, there. It's not just the backstory. It's that when you come here, your beers are split up. Saints and Sinners. It's what like he was talking kinda, about earlier. Kind of yeah. talking about earlier yeah. where those higher ABV or more intense flavored beers are sinners. And we, uh, the lighter session. And we also, I mean, it's kind of our, she's a no. yeah, right, we're, right we're, now, yeah, I'm on Lucy. Um, being well, the, we're being nice right now. <laughs> we're the, on, uh, so that, I mean, but that's also kind of a, uh, the big part of it. You know, I've, I've met people who are considered saints or sinners, but they're all, they can be good people one way or the other. We just don't like assholes here. So just don't be, you've had people, I mean, you're drinking beer. It's one of those weird things. Eventually somebody's going to be at least somewhat, you know, down that road. But, you know, when you get there, are you going to be a dick or are you going to be a nice person? <laughs> and it turns out that... You can still be a sinner and be a nice person. You can. So that's why it doesn't really matter. Saint, sinner, whatever. You'll see, so you'll see like, kind of anybody who wanders in here. Uh, yeah. Did you have much blowback opening a brewery in that church? No. Turns out the people who are that churchy just don't come, is what it turns <laughs> yeah. out. You they are. don't care enough? <laughs> oh, yeah. I'm My feet are Okay. But uh, <laughs> it turns out the people who really care that much just wouldn't even bother. Uh, you know, they just they just don't come. Uh, cool. And the cool thing is, everybody else is like, "Hell yeah, drinking at church this is the best." <laughs> so it works out really well. We've had people. Uh, are, alcohol comes from religion, anyhow. When we when we opened the new building, we had I, I remember it was still it was like the first weekend. This guy goes up. He was like one of our first customers. He's like, "I couldn't wait till you opened up in here. I got baptized in here. Now I'm drinking a beer. This is awesome." <laughs> and I was like, awesome. "That's pretty badass." That's a good one. Kind of off the beaten path a little bit. Um, it's a great, beautiful space, but how hard was it to get people to come out here? Or, or was that even part of your business plan to begin with? Was it more production and distribute? Or was it to get people out here? Or was it always both? No, it was uh, primarily we're focused on um, you know, our brew house. We have a 30 barrel brew house. So we, we have to focus on getting beer to market because as much as we can do here, our, our bread needs to be baked by going to market. Um, you know, we need to be in bars, we need to be visible, uh, we need to be in cans, you know, so, so we're on grocery store shelves, things like that. That's where volume will come from, overall large volume. Um, and so that was the original goal. I mean, we always wanted to turn this into a place people wanted to come and enjoy our culture and see what we could do, uh, see what we do here. And, um, but I, I never like launched with that. So from November 20th when we had beer to market, we didn't open at the brewery at all until the following March. Um, so. It was just not, we weren't really prepped for it. I really didn't like the idea of bringing a bunch of people into my production facility. Uh, like I said, I'm a huge nerd, and I just didn't like the idea of mixing the two. But we had so many questions, and this, that, and the other, that where I finally had to break down and say, okay, um, let's do it. And so for the first two years, we opened up just in, the, in there. So every Friday, we'd open up for one day a week, Saturday from noon to five, that was it. And uh, so every Friday, we'd get the entire brewery like kind of packed away so we could have all the chairs and or all the tables and stuff out and roped off and this, that, and the other, and we had an eight-tap direct draw. And then on every Monday, we'd spend picking all that up, cleaning up, things like that. Of course, we had, we had the sales. We didn't, This whole area, this little like park area, we've been working on, uh, I think we got it kind of ready right before opening of the tap room last year, so about two Aprils ago, or last April. Um, this was all overgrown. We actually thought there was going to be a lot more good trees in it. Um, we were wrong. It turns out it was just mostly vines. <laughs> Uh, vines and trash, um, lots and lots of trash. So you did some great work on it then, because it's a beautiful space. It, it, now. It's it's taking a lot of work. There was a lot. I mean, there was like little trash trees, but nothing to keep. You know, things that you, they weren't good trees. They were just glorified weeds or bushes that kind of you know they they weren't really they didn't need to be around. So we got rid of some of those and. 
and it's kind of turned out and it's taken some time to, to curate it but you know we didn't have this so basically everything would kind of stop around that like white shed because coming over here there was no reason to do it you know this was all overgrown you know this there was there was no tables or anything over here it was so you know we still had big parties and everything like that you know because we had the sales and um, at the time we when we first opened we didn't even have the stage because we didn't have live music so it's funny how it's evolved um, and it turns out that the most popular item I think we possibly have are indoor restrooms. Um, <laughs> yeah, everybody really likes Instead the indoor of, restrooms. Uh, porta potties or something. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so and we still have some around the corner, but, uh, but yeah, so apparently that's the most popular thing. And we're constantly asked when we're going to install more. Uh, and I said, look, we're going to get there. Just give us. I mean, we gave you two. We still got the porta potty. I mean, like y you got to give me some time. Like we did this. You know, we, we have different projects. So like all last year, we were spending money on getting this ready. So this building had been let go not as bad as that building because they kind of so this is this basically by the time we had gotten it was a tax shelter um it was a speaking in tongue snake handling kind of church apparently which is awesome because we found some awesome <laughs> artifacts from that shit um but um uh, that wait, building wait, 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 clarify that what you just said because that was really fast you said speaking in tongues snake Thank handling you, yeah, yeah, church. Yeah, one of the whatever and that that's is where you're... we're not gonna let that go <laughs> no. and we're that's where your tap that. room's at right now no, no, that's that was over there. That was the room. That yeah, was and so and so the, the that's the, that's the guy who wanted to be the new Joel Osteen. Okay. Then yes. he rented this building out to a small Joel Hispanic. Did snake, snake he doesn't, tongue. but that's why. Yeah, okay. I, hey, look, I didn't say any of it made <laughs> sense. I'm that, just yeah. telling you <laughs> that this is all shit that this happened. This is maybe why he also, didn't succeed. Also, <laughs> so that building was basically split in half. That whole side was a sanctuary. This whole side was there was a kitchen area. There was a couple of classrooms. There was offices. There was a whole second floor for um, storage and an attic kind of area. Um, but when you went back behind the stage, there was two. There was two things. So the stage, which was built very. Remember, I, I, when they built it, they built it well. It's just who had it that we got it from right. didn't take care of it. Right. On the right side should have been a sound room that didn't have working lights. So, whatever. On the left side was a hot water heater because there's a baptismal in the middle. But in there really was like. Um, it was like uh, gun reloading, a uh, shell reloading stuff. And so apparently he was an avid gun fan, which is interesting because I'm not sure what he's afraid of, except maybe snake. I don't know. Maybe it was a <laughs> snake. <laughs> but either way, that was in there. And so just just very, very odd, every all the way around. And so they leased this building out to a small Mexican church. They had service like one time a week from 7.30 to 8 in the morning on Sundays, one time. These guys had church at least like two or three times a week, which I'm like, all right, that's at least somewhat legitimate. But they charged them rent. And I was like, all right. And so this building, while in, like, it was cleaner, but it was in rougher shape. So inside there, when you walk in, you'll see that we have, you know, we have the pillars now. Mm -hmm. It used to be open span. It was never designed to be open span. It actually had a okay. truss system, so there should have been a beam across the bottom, which would make the, sh the ceiling sh shorter. Mm -hmm. I think that's why they took it out. The problem is, from a structural standpoint, you have to have those things or else the building falls uh -huh. over. And so somebody just made an executive decision that said, you know what, we don't need this. Um, and so when we really were looking at it, oh, man. the building, you know, the, the walls were out and the, the ceiling had sunk. And so we jacked it up to get it mostly right again. And that's why we had to, so we put, we actually installed a metal I-beam all the way down. And that's what those, there's, there's actually four inch pipe holding it up. We just wrapped it in wood, um, which is what that is. So now it's strong and safe again, thank God, uh, or whoever. Um, <laughs> They could have used all, uh, a, uh, a, a carpentry lesson from JC, apparently, because it was pretty shitty. How long did it take um, you to do all that? A year. Well, it took a year. So at the time, my cousin CJ was working with us, and he uh, he was in... Uh, so you can notice there's a lot of family. So my dad's around here somewhere. My Uncle Bill was here. He left. And then I hired on my cousin CJ, and then I have buddy Dan. They have all... Uh, Dan and CJ have left. CJ wanted to go back to Oklahoma, so he left last June. But he spent his like pretty much that year from April to April working on that when we started, and uh, it just took all, it took pretty much all of our free time, took all of our free cash flow as well. Um, but it was something that we really felt was worth doing, so we're really happy with it. But um, that's where when people are like, "Oh, we need more bathrooms," I was like, "No, no, no. This year I get stuff at the brewery." <laughs> so like we got it, we got a canning line finally. Uh, we've been using mobile canning for two years, and it was just you know, nothing wrong with the mobile canners, but it was just time to have our own. So you mentioned earlier that you were a scientist and a nerd. Yeah. Do you feel that that piece of you and that educational piece has definitely helped in building your brewery oh, yeah. and your beer? No, I mean, it ha it, yeah, absolutely, it, it has to. It, it gives me the tools. So I didn't ever get to go to a brewing school, um, chemical engineering background. But what the PhD and stuff like that did was I can learn it quickly on my own, and so going through classes where I go through those concepts in a book, I don't necessarily need, which is lucky for me, um, because a lot of it is just applied to the brewing industry. 
and water chemistry is just chemistry. It's just for beer and why you do things for beer. And it's actually kind of a concise amount because you're not just looking at the whole world of the potential reactions that could occur. It's concise. And so picking that up is not hard. Um, another big part is the dynamics. Kimmy, no problem. That's my, that's my jam. Um, and uh, just because I'm not, it's just not my, some people are really into bio. It's never been my thing. I'm more of an inorganic guy, sort of organic chemistry guy. So that's the most where I've had to push myself to really get into it, because otherwise I just find it otherworldly boring. Um, I could never be an MD because I don't want to cut people open, nor do I have any interest in <laughs> what goes where. I mean, I have, I, of course, I have an appreciation for it, but it's just not what I want to sit and study and be that familiar with. Um, but yeast, luckily, is still a single cell organism. I can, you know, I can get behind it. I can learn about it, and, and I have. And of course, I have a huge passion for yeast because they're so important to the beer making process. I mean. Um, it's sad that when I see beers are like, hey, I made a, I made this, but I added, you know, let's just say, for instance, Hefeweizens or wheat beers I see a lot, made with coriander and orange peel. Why the shit are you adding that? Let the yeast do their thing. Just for a little warmer, they'll add all of the, like, clove, banana, the phenolics, the esters. You can produce all that. You don't need to add extra shit in there to make it taste like the guys did back in Germany. You know why? Because the yeast will do that for you. You don't need to do that. But somebody hasn't figured that out. Well, they yeah, it's there. <laughs> it's all there. The Pay right? fucking attention. Like, right. learn. Don't be so shit scared of, you know, really learn what the yeast can do. Yeah, I know. White Lab said you can ferment from here to here. Fucking, that's what you need a pilot for. Go out and experiment. Try a little bit. Push the boundaries. Why do you think that, if you look at it historically, this beer style has been just refined and refined and refined over centuries. Do you think that they were sitting there going like, Chris White, what's what's this stuff and what's, what should I permit? No, they had whatever was fucking local. And that's the awesome thing about beer. When beer turned bad, they just dumped that out. And when this one turned out good, they used that weird shit at the bottom and they did it again. Uh, in fact, it's amazing when you think about the first Saison guy. It was a farmer who had some extra grain and it barely got wet. And there's some liquid and yeah. it's thought like, oh, fuck it, I'll drink that. Ballsy dude. Like, it couldn't have smelled like water. Um, you know, he, you know, you have water that could maybe kill you because of germs and that. And he said, I'll try this funky-ass barrel under my shed. And it worked out for him, and beer was born. The farmhouse style, you know, and then each farmer did that same thing. So, you know, it's awesome if you think about that, but you think about that they were firming this maybe in summer or whatever. They didn't have temperature control. Maybe they did in the cave or whatever, but it was usually not these ideal temperature ranges. That's why loggers are amazing, the fact that they could actually do that because they could keep them cold enough and long enough. I mean, today we know so much more about it that we can be educated about it and make good decisions about how to do things in an expedited fashion because we know how to keep them healthier longer. We know how to ferment them where they're happier longer. We know how to make them happy so they do things quicker. So we know things like that, but again, you have to want to and then also apply it in the correct fashion. And that's where... The brewing side of it really needs to go back to learning to brew. I'm mostly, I'm a German lager brewer, uh, traditional, I mean, that's what I really like to focus on, German ales, things like that. Right now you see a little bit more other stuff, but I think there's just so much flavor there that, it, and it's awesome beer because you can drink it all day long. It, it's, it's brilliant. But it... Tune in next week for part two of Back Pew Brewing. Bobby will definitely keep you entertained and educated with his unfiltered opinion of AB and Bev while talking more about marketing in a saturated market of big beer versus craft beer. Be sure to subscribe now so you don't miss out. We'd love to hear from you. Are you a saint or a sinner? What makes you one or the other? Let us know in the comments below or by clicking the link in the description. <laughs> Keep cutting my face off, camera. It's not important. She's just um, a pretty face. <laughs>